All right, it's a cutting edge, Energy 808. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And as you know, Marco Mangelstorff of ProVision Solar is on the other phone, and we are talking to him now for Energy 808. Uh, welcome back to your show, Marco. Well, it's a wonderful day in, uh, in our neighborhood, Jay, whenever I get a chance to, to talk to you, my friend. So thank you for having me on and having it be our show. Yeah, well, we, you know, we just uh, submitted one to OC16, and uh, it includes all the energy shows, including, the, uh, including Energy 808. And uh, one of them is uh, the one with, uh, with Jay, Jay Griffin. And um, that, was, that was really a good one, I might add. That was a few weeks ago. So we have a good show going. There's no question about it. Well, as uh, that good old-fashioned uh, Ed Sullivan used to say, we have a really big shoe for you all, really big shoe. Okay, so online today, we're going to talk first about these two charts and the pattern of uh, increasing renewable energy or not in the state of Hawaii. And then we're also going to talk about KIUC uh, and the recent outage and, uh, you know, the, what, what it means to build a resilient system. Uh, so let's talk about the graphs first. And I suppose I'd like to hear you introduce the graphs, and then we'll put them on the screen. You know me, Jay. Part of uh, part of uh, my pleasure in life is to uh, data crunch and data analyze. And there uh, is all kinds of interesting stuff out there regarding uh, the energy use patterns of, of our beautiful Aloha State. And uh, our friends at DBED came up with their annual uh, Hawaii Energy Report last week and uh, I've also been doing some of my own data crunching as well with some friends so I'm just trying to kind of see you know a snapshot in time based on 2017 data because that's the most recent apparently that's uh, that's actually available and not not 2018 is uh, what energy what kind of energy are we using? Uh, well, this is kind of an odd way to put it. The energy that we are using, where is it coming from? Not where is it coming from, literally, as in is it shipping from Alaska, is it shipping from Malaysia, but uh, where is it coming from by source? And over time, we can judge whether we're making progress towards becoming more energy independent and more energy resilient by not being so dependent on on energy sources, uh, principally petroleum, that come from a very, very far uh, distances. So I think one of the things that's still so striking to me is if you look at energy consumption, total energy consumption in the state, which uh, typically is going to, and I see on the screen there, is on the right side is the, the brown uh, pie chart. Uh, what's so striking to me is that the uh, percentage of uh, energy supplied by oil, by petroleum products, is still incredibly high, as in, in this particular pie chart, 83.9%, call it 84. And regardless of, of the intentions, the good intentions, the well-meaning intentions uh, that go back decades, you know, and kind of Speaking perhaps at the Hawaii Clean Energy Act signed with a bunch of hoopla now at 11 years ago, that we still remain shockingly, shockingly, dangerously dependent on oil coming from great distances uh, to power our, our society, our economy. So I think that to me is the, the number one takeaway. We've made some progress uh, in terms of electricity production coming from other sources uh, other than oil, but uh, at the same time, we're close to 70% dependent still on petroleum for energy production, at least according to 2018 figures. So we have uh, a tremendous distance to go, and uh, I really feel a greater sense of urgency now than I did a year, two years, or five or 10 years ago that the progress we're making uh, is just not enough. It's not enough both for our state, it's not enough for our country, it's not enough for the planet to get off this damn petroleum kick. And I'll just remind you uh, what I've heard in the past, and I assume with justification, that Hawaii uses more oil to generate electricity than the rest of the uh, continental U.S. combined. 
So, yes, we make progress. Yes, we're the most solarized state in the country per capita, both solar thermal and solar PV. But, my goodness, do we have a long, long ways to go. And we need to accelerate our efforts, double, triple, quadruple them in order to, to move faster. A couple of reactions and thoughts, Marco. Number one is, uh, gee, I guess it was five or six, maybe more years ago, at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, um, through the, uh, the efforts of uh, Carl Friedman there, um, was going to develop an index, an index of renewable energy, and including you know, non-renewables also, so that we could get a handle on this. <laughs> the idea was uh, to follow it on a, on a periodic basis so we would know how much progress we've made. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't seen, I haven't seen uh, the index for quite some time. I'm not sure that there is a current index, and, and so I'm, I'm not sure that we're going to, that HEPF, YHE Policy Forum is, is going to continue that. But it seems to me that somebody ought to do it. The other reaction I have is you said that the, uh, the last one that DBED did through the Energy Office, I guess, was the one for uh, calendar 2017. That's two years ago. I mean, if this is an important initiative, we need to have current numbers, and we need to have them right away. We need to have them immediately after the year is done or as soon as possible after the year is done so we can get a handle on where we're going so the legislature can take appropriate steps so that the policymakers can you know, develop policy and how you get from here to 100%. And I certainly agree that there's you know, not that much happening according to these charts. So how are these charts created? How do, we, how do we get the information that is on both of these charts? Let's take the one from 2017 first, because that was the one that DBED did. Huh? Uh, I didn't necessarily say DBED did it. Uh, I said that the one with the, the brown pie chart, uh, Hawaii Energy Consumption by Source 2017, that was put together by, uh, by myself and some associates. So uh, there are other charts, pie charts, in the Hawaii Energy Report that DBED released last week um, about electricity production specifically that, uh, that does date back to, to 2017. You know, in terms of getting more timely data, uh, the uh, Energy Information Administration, which is a part, I believe, of the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, they are responsible for uh, perhaps a little bit more real-time data including 2018, so that uh, the, the, blue plight, the blue pie chart, uh, which you showed uh, on the screen a few moments ago, Hawaii electricity production by source 2018, obviously 2018 is a little bit more recent than 20, 2017. Um, I don't know where else to go with this. Uh, I was struck by, uh, in terms of Hawaii energy consumption by source uh, back in 2017, that after petroleum, uh, the second largest source was coal. Well, let's see the which is 2017 kind of, chart so we can uh, check correct. on what, what Marco was saying. That's it. Uh, was coal, uh, which is kind of interesting because, uh, as far as I know, the only place in, uh, that is burning coal now is uh, the AES power plant on Oahu, which is scheduled to close no later than 2022. So, obviously, that number will come down. But then this, the third largest uh, energy cons energy source by consumption is solar, and that 4.4 percent is a combined a combination of solar uh, PV photovoltaic, converting sunlight to electricity, and also uh, solar thermal or water heating in this case. So, you know, I'm hardened as a solar guy to see that in terms of consumption by source, at least as of uh, uh, 2017, that solar was the second, third, excuse me, third largest source of, of energy, not just electricity production, but energy writ large, whether you're typically measured in BTUs or British thermal units, the solar was number three, you know, albeit, you know, 4.4%, we have a long ways to go. So, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's going to take time, and it'd be great if uh, there was a, a way of measuring pie charts and looking, comparing pie charts over time, but God, the size of the brown uh, oil in that uh, consumption by source going back to 2017 is just, 
It's shocking, Jay. It's shocking. You know, there's so much talk about renewable energy in the state and about what Hawaiian Electric is doing, KIUC is doing, and what we're all doing. And yet, you look at this pie chart and you're thinking, my God, it's still so much damn oil coming into the state. How long is it going to take for us to really cut that that 84% of the pie chart down to to 50 and less. I mean, gosh, we just have such a long ways to go. And I try not to feel discouraged about it, but when I see pie charts like this, it just kind of whacks me from my, uh, you know, not that I'm complacent to begin with, but it just, yeah, it kind of takes my breath away. Well, and, uh, you know, 2040, uh, which is Hawaiian Electric's number a uh, year, and 2045, which is the state target, um, that's not too far away. That's 20 or 25 years. I mean, it's a, you know, we, we need to work much harder. So what, what's going to happen in 2019? Do you have the uh, a handle on what 2019 will look like as against 2017, 2018? Well, uh, 2019 will be show um, zero uh, geothermal in terms of electricity production. Mm -hmm. Back in 2018, it was 3.2%. Uh, I don't think anybody can in their right mind make a case that uh, Puna Geothermal Venture will be putting out power and selling it to Helco by the end of the year. Uh, at least that's my, my take. I think they still have a fair amount, to, uh, fair amount of this road to, to travel before they go online, if they go online. Well, so, well, and they have the old behold, uh, you know, cultural resistance. That has always existed, and uh, who knows, that may be uh, exacerbated by what's going on in Mauna Kea. Yeah, but the Mauna Kea stuff is just a whole other subject that we could spend hours talking about. But uh, So geothermal is uh, it's not going to happen, most likely, this year. So a solar, the solar percentage will go up. Biomass, which is essentially age power there on Oahu, I think will be pretty steady. Coal will be pretty steady. Hydro will be pretty steady. Wind will be pretty steady. So I think the, the increase in renewables for 2019 uh, will be a marginal increase. Uh, uh, I, I see KIUC probably hitting somewhere over 50% in terms of their total generation uh, will come from renewables for this year cumulatively. I think Hawaiian Electric is going to be pretty darn close to where they were last year and where they were in 2017 when they hit 27% in terms of their renewable uh, portfolio standard percentage, which they need to uh, report uh, to the PUC on, a, on an annual basis. So uh, I can't make the case that 2019 is going to look all that better cumulatively than, than 2018. So what's our big hope? You know, one of these smaller slices in the pie uh, eating the, the larger uh, oil slice. Uh, is it, is it uh, solar? Um, what, you know, what, what, is, what is going to be the driving force going forward to change, to change the pie? Uh, and if it's solar, how do we get there? What do we do to increase the solar slice of this pie? Because to me, that's our, the most promising renewable we have. Well, one of the things we don't do is uh, ramp down the state's renewable energy investment tax, renewable energy investment technology tax credit. Ooh, talk about a mouthful. Uh, we don't <laughs> ramp that down precipitously uh, anytime soon because uh, the tax credit is a very important component in terms of encouraging solar uh, I would also, as I've been lamenting for the past four years, I think it's uh, very important to have a separate tax credit for battery storage, for adding battery storage to existing renewable generation, because that's a, a very critical part of getting to where we need to go. Uh, what else can we do? I, I think, uh, you know, the... I think the Commission and Hawaiian Electric need to come up with some type of strategy to incentivize uh, better incentives to be able to incentivize people providing power to the utility company when they need it the most. And when they need it the most is during peak power, typically between 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. on a seven-day-a-week basis. I don't believe the incentives are great enough. Uh, that encourage people to be sharing their stored solar power with the utility company. At a, it needs to be at a more advantageous rate. So if I had my druthers, I would like to see 
a more lucrative remuneration uh, tariff or schedule to be able to incentivize people to provide uh, power to the grid when they need it the most. So those are a few things that, that come to mind. It's all about incentives. Uh, and it's all about changing public behavior through incentives. And I, you know, I don't think the legislature is, is really hot on this issue. They haven't done anything on that uh, storage credit bill in too many years. Um, and, I, and I actually worry that the momentum that we had a few years ago about developing renewables uh, and clean energy uh, may, have, may have lost some energy, excuse the expression. Um, do, do you agree with me on that? Yeah, yeah, you know, being uh, on the neighbor island as I have been for, for close to 20 years, I'm not perhaps as, you know, we're not tied in as closely kind of to the pulse of the main, the main action there on Oahu, so it's more kind of a um, little bit of um, impressionistic feeling I have, but it seems to me that we have lost some of our oomph. And you know, I'm not, I don't want to point fingers because that doesn't do any good, although there are a number of entities or individuals I think are worthy to be pointed at. But we have, I think we've, we, we've lost a bit of our, our mojo um, as of late, and uh, I'm not really sure what to do about it. I mean, I know uh, that uh, the, gov the state is recruiting for a new uh, director for the Hawaii State Energy Office. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, it'd be great if there were someone dynamic, you know, super energetic, uh, whether they're from the state or not. I don't know. Uh, but we just, we need more visionaries, Jay. We need, we need more people who are disruptors and who are, who are posing, who, who are willing to push the boundaries. And I think part of our culture here, both um, kind of sociologically and business climate is, uh, you know, don't don't put stick your head up above the firing line too high because it's going to get whacked off. So I think there's there's kind of a tendency towards risk aversion here on multiple levels, and I just don't see that being I don't see that suiting us well at this point in in the state's evolution. So I'm I'm all for bringing more visionary disruptors to the forefront and. And that takes a lot of courage, you know. It takes the willingness to, to take a lot of arrows, and uh, there just don't seem to be all that many people out there who fit that bill, from, from what I can tell. Well, that's that's a perfect segue to the second part of our show. You know, I recall um, David Bissell at, at more than one of our programs at the Energy Policy Forum saying that um, you had you had to appreciate the risks because this is new territory. And trying to make a you know a plan to cover the whole state in a thing that's so critical to our daily lives and our economy uh, does has to involve a certain amount of risk. It's new territory, um, and he said once you appreciate that, then you make your choices. And of course, one of the big choices KIUC has made is is to go solar in big solar facilities with batteries, I might add. But um, you know, a week or two ago, uh, they, they had a sh uh, 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 an outage. And we should talk about that. We should talk about that in terms of taking the risk and how we can ameliorate that risk even further going forward. You got any thoughts? Yeah, and, uh, you know, one of the worst uh, situations for any grid operator is when you have a failure uh, in terms of uh, generation goes offline and uh, it, it gets uh, worse and worse when, when that failure comes from, let's say, your largest generator. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that was the case on Kauai. Uh, a little over a week ago, and uh, that caused substantial disruption, obviously, in terms of people being able to use electricity there. And uh, David Bissell and his crew there at KIC, I think, have done a fantastic job at integrating uh, utility-scale solar and storage, and uh, they've, uh, they've been very aggressive over the years, and I really salute them for that. So what happened, essentially, is that you had this uh, substantial failure of the main generator going offline, and you had solar and batteries that have been deployed uh, by the uh, on the utility side of the meter. And as it turns out, the the weather was kind of poor those days. So when the weather is poor, you know there ain't much solar generation, and those batteries are not designed to pro provide power. Uh, for 24 hours. No, They're just a few hours. I, I remember touring the facility there. Um, it was the Tesla facility. 
And uh, it was only a few hours. It might not even be overnight. So there was a combination of, uh, you know, essentially the poor weather and uh, solar wasn't able to do much. The storage wasn't able to do much. And that kind of reiterated to me something I've been pondering for, for quite a while, which is it's all well and good to talk about getting to 100% renewable power generation by such and such a date. Uh, you know, as a kind of techno-interested guy, um, I ask myself, how are we going to do that, practically speaking? And I foresee and I believe strongly that at least for the next couple of decades that there will have to be, continue to be a combustion generation on all of our islands to be able to provide that backup, that backbone, that resiliency for when the sun don't shine for days upon days. So if you buy my, my argument here that combustion generation is not going to go away any time soon, then the, the juicy question is what alternative fuels can we use for these combustion generators? In the case of my island, we have combustion turbines, two of them each, uh, Kehole, which is the largest plant on the island, 80 megawatts, and two of them uh, at uh, Honaka for Hamaku Energy. So I know for a fact that these General Electric combustion turbines, other companies, including Mitsubishi, have been looking at alternate fuels other than typical petroleum products, and I happen to be particularly interested in the potential for using H2, also known as hydrogen, to be able to power these turbines. Because if we can produce hydrogen at a cost-effective rate and also adequate supplies of it in the, in the state or on this island, then that solves a really critical part of the, of the puzzle here, that we do need combustion generation. We will continue to need combustion generation for decades to come as we deploy more solar, as we deploy more batteries, and we need to have a fuel source that is reliable cost-effective and environmentally clean and benign to be able to power these combustion turbines. That's my, my little speech, and I'm sticking to it. I, you know, I, I didn't send this to you, but I saw yesterday a very interesting um, YouTube video, in fact, a series of YouTube videos about making hydrogen from water. It uh, needs a certain amount of electricity to do that, but at the end of the day, you get more hydrogen than you, you would get using an electrolyzer. Um, and it's done with catalytic agents um, that, are, that are available. And, and so um, this one video I saw showed a guy with a scientist uh, who created a, a gizmo who, that, will, that will fill his car with hydrogen. And of course, when you add the hydrogen to a fuel cell, you know, you get a, a secondary effect in terms of the efficiency, I believe. But, right. uh, what, you know, what, what I'm thinking is that we have, we have been focused on electrolyzers. You know, Hank Rogers in the Big Island has one um, to, to create uh, hydrogen. Um, but there may be other ways to do it. And maybe they're more efficient. And maybe in the future we'll have more hydrogen. It's very promising hydrogen, although it's not there yet. Um, the right. other thought I have to respond to you um, is LNG. You know, we have a, uh, we have a, a sort of guest host by the name of Lu Lucien Pudirisi, who is the CEO of a th an energy think tank in Washington, who we visit with here on uh, Think Tech every couple of weeks. The show is called uh, Energy in America. And uh, he talks about LNG, he talks about LNG uh, as a bridge fuel, as a popular fuel, not only in the United States, but everywhere. Uh, it's a big export item and going to be more so with these, um, these tankers. Uh, and it's going, it's going in through Japan to Asia. Um, Europe is using it. Um, and it's uh, cheaper, cleaner than oil. So if you're looking for a sort of step transaction <clears throat> to move us into a, a better fuel, although technically still a fossil fuel, uh, LNG is a real possibility and better than oil. And I think the world is moving that way, according to Lou Pugliarisi. Uh I don't know if that helps here in Hawaii. But um, that has always been a possibility, and it is much more a possibility today. Thoughts? Jay, I would find it inconceivable that the current governor, David Ige, would, would reverse his stance on, on LNG, his, his opposition to LNG as a so-called bridge fuel. I don't think he's going to do that. And I would find it inconceivable that whoever follows 
Ige in, um, into the, uh, the governor's mansion, that they believe that this is something that he or she wants to see happen. Not only that, I just do not see the political will or the political buy-in to, to, to go that route. I just can't make that. that I, mean, I, number, I, you know. I would not disagree. I think it's a real uphill um, in Hawaii, although in other places it seems to be working. The, the other side of that, though, is very clear to me that we have to have resilience here, uh, that right now we're not in a position where we can use the solar plus storage for a variety of reasons, mostly, I guess, around the efficiency of solar and the efficiency of storage. Uh, I, I heard within the last couple of weeks that somebody had invented uh, or was in the process of developing a, uh, a new kind of uh, solar cell that was well, like twice as efficient as the existing ones. This is not on the market or near the market, but uh, this is one of those technologies that could be promising and give us solar cells that give us you know, much more efficiency. On batteries, I haven't heard anything much, but I'm sure there are you know, uh, similar developments in the science about batteries. So right now, I don't, you know, and KOC is a good uh, example of this. Right now, we really don't have a, uh, what do you call it, solar plus battery system available, at least at an economic uh, cost, uh, you know, to rely on it. And that's why the pie charts show so much oil. Uh, furthermore, that we, you know, we, we have, this is, this is our lives here, this electricity. Uh, it's our economy. We can't afford to go down. We can't afford blackouts. Um, so we have to have a resilient system. And I, and I, I can see that going forward, even if we increase the pie chart um, by, you know, various renewables, um, we still have to have the oil or the resilience. It might be a pie chart, which is um, a bigger pie, if you will, or a pie with more than 100 percent of, of contributing factors. We have to be able uh, to step in and, and save the day if the existing technology, the, you know, the front end technology doesn't work. And that's going to last for hmm, decades, don't you think? I agree. I agree. It's, um, I think we all kind of want to go in the same direction as an argument uh, discussion over uh, not so much the overall direction we want to go in, but uh, the uh, the tactical decisions we make along the way, and who you know whose ox gets gets gored, and uh, uh, I don't know. I'm I, I go back and forth between feeling kind of more optimistic and less optimistic, and right now I'm kind of in a when I see these kind of pie charts, I think, oh man, we just have so so far to go. Well, let's uh, let's focus on the next step. If I ask you, Marco, what is the next step we should take to make you feel more optimistic? What would that be? <laughs> <laughs> more disruptors, my friend. More disruptors at key companies uh, and agencies that uh, are are willing to be more risk acceptant and uh, willing to take slings and arrows and uh, and just uh, shake things up a bit rather than just kind of plod, P-O-L-D, plod along. Less plotters, more disruptors. Well, I think this is a disruptive uh, conversation. Uh, and I, <laughs> it is, because I think what it suggests to me is that you and I ought to follow this thread going forward. We, all, we always need to be looking for those disruptors, that leadership, for that technology, um, you know, for that mindset that'll take us somewhere. Uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll meet our targets. Um, but for now, all I can do is uh, sign off and hope that we can track on this uh, going forward, Marco. Well, you do, you have, and you forever shall rock my world, dear, dear Jay Fidel. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to our next discussion in two weeks. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha.